Hello, hello, good afternoon. So when I report on artificial intelligence, when I report on the space, the thing that I hear a lot is fear. Fear about who's going to lose jobs, what that's going to mean for workers, what's going to mean for communities. So I want to start off talking about what you each think is the biggest challenge facing AI and its integration into the workforce. Sean, can I start with you? Look, I, I think the biggest um, challenge integrating AI into workforce is uh, how it interacts with people. And um, I think if you think about it as kind of a broad intelligence um, that has certain kinds of capabilities that are somewhat different to humans, the, the, the challenge then is really how you bring the two of them together to make them actually work in a productive fashion. And I think that's probably the single biggest challenge. Think of it as a new intelligence. We've got human intelligence. They do different things. How do you make the best intelligence by combining the two aspects of them together? Yeah, Dolores. And I think the largest challenge that we're facing is the skills gap uh, between communities that have been historically underrepresented within the tech field um, that are already experiencing challenges in adopting STEM education at the elementary and secondary level, but also in terms of the existing composition of the workforce and the need to infuse these skills very quickly uh, for a job of tomorrow um, as opposed to a job for 20 years from now. So I used to work at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and when I started looking at AI for employment selection purposes, I was all about the fear and the danger. <laughs> and since I've transitioned over to working for a vendor who does this type of work, employment selection using AI, I see a lot of promise. Um, for example, uh, Pymetrics, the company that I work for, is very much about potential over pedigree. So where, I think I heard it earlier in, a, in an earlier forum about you know, for certain jobs, the age-old way of selection is like, what school did you go to? You know, what uh, experiences have you had prior to this position? And now we can actually use AI and data science to have a look at what could you do in the future? Mm -hmm. um, and it really does put us in a place for, uh, you know, changing to the new economy and also being fair and uh, valid in our selections. Kelly and Sean, I actually want you to dig a little deeper on that, how AI can be used in the hiring process to eliminate bias as opposed to exacerbate it? Sure, so the, I could speak most directly about the way that I know how to use it, which is pretty straightforward. Um, the, way that, uh, the way that I've seen it work is any AI algorithm has to be trained based on a training data set. Um, and so the question often comes up, well, what if you train the algorithm on a set of white men? Then aren't you gonna go ahead and just select more white men? which is a great question. And people who are asking that question are thinking about it in the right way. What you're able to do, though, is isolate that problem and say, now, how do I fix it? So with Pymetrics, for example, um, we have a look at the algorithm that we build for selection. Does it cause adverse impact in the language of EEOC? And if it does, what is the, the variable or the factor that's going in that's causing it? What happens if we drop that? Now check again. So in regulatory language, any lawyers in the audience, <laughs> this is basically an automated search for the least discriminatory alternative, which really fits with the regulations in this space. Yeah, Sean? Yeah, look, I think it's interesting when you, when you think about um, the, the, the data that you expose your models to, and in some ways that's, that's the heart of this, right? If you're gonna train a model, you know, what data are you showing it? Because it ultimately it's gonna learn the structure from within that, and you know, one of the things that you know, we did when we looked at um, one of the projects was building self-writing Wikipedia pages. And the first thing we looked at was, you know, can you, you know, build models to kind of predict who should have a Wikipedia page? And of course, if you, if you went out and trained this on all the existing Wikipedia pages, you're effectively encoding all of the collective biases that we've had when we've put um, that together. And of course, one of the big ones was gender, right? So that would be a bad thing to train the model on, right? But maybe a good thing to train the model on was if you did have a Wikipedia page, how should it be written, right? So there's sort of, you know, aspects of data where some of it can be very good and some of it, you know, may be very bad. And I think you have to sit back and then make a value judgment as to kind of how you want to encode things. And so I think looking at data, it's say, well, where are the biases? Do I want to keep them? Do I want to remove them? Um, and that's, that's probably the heart of every design of every algorithm. And to this point, I mean, I think looking at this, making this value judgment is really important. When we think about inclusivity in this space, oftentimes it's, well, how is the AI platform going to impact certain communities and not so much of, well, who is actually building it at the onset? So we think about, you know, who is actually informing these data sets? Who is helping to make these value judgments at the beginning so that we don't have to be reactionary um, when we're kind of controlling for ethical bias or discrimination uh, at the end of these algorithms when they've already been com uh, computed, excuse me. Well, Lars, that actually goes into a question I wanted to ask you, which is, how are we doing on this front? Do you see mostly reactionary kind of 
efforts being made, or do you think that we're finally in a place where people are kind of thinking about some of the baked-in bias and kind of working on it at the outset? I think we are in a transition period. I think I've seen you know, a number of companies adopting this at the onset, but also I've seen a number of companies that don't yet want to release the data statistics on actually who is on their AI teams. We see a number of companies releasing diversity statistics in terms of employment overall, but in the composition of those AI teams, that's somewhere where sometimes we want to get a little bit more silent. And that silence to me is illuminating. It speaks volumes as to what's actually happening behind closed doors. Um, and I do think that we do, you know, we see a trend towards more diversity and inclusion. We're speaking out about these issues. We're talking about them, and that's the first step, but there's always much more that can be done um, in order to prevent bias as opposed to being reactionary to that. Right. We're in DC, so I always have to ask a policy and regulation question. So to that point, I'm wondering, to what end do you think policymakers and regulators should be involved in making sure that as AI is deployed, it is inclusive, it includes diversity, and that we are thinking through these. Kelly, let's start with you, obviously. Sure. <laughs> so I think that there definitely need, I heard this earlier in an earlier panel as well, partnerships are really important because having been you know, on that side of things, talk about reactionary. I mean, it is a bit like, wait, what's happening? <laughs> and that's kind of how I learned that this whole movement was occurring, was like, oh, I'm seeing like certain things and charges and challenges. And it's like, okay, let me learn about it. So I think I would say that uh, regulatory agencies, that the government employees are very interested. They want to learn. And so they want to get ahead of, you know, the issues. I think partnerships, um, really important. And I think there absolutely is a place for regulation in all of this. And I, I also don't think, this is a little bit controversial, um, I also don't think necessarily that all of the old regulations are terrible and they won't work. Um, I think it's possible to think about sort of new approaches, at least in the area I work, um, employment selection, and look at old regulations. Like there's one called the Uniform Guidelines on Employee Selection Procedures, and that was written in 1978. It's very old. But there is a way to look at it as a framework for how we should be considering these types of selection procedures um, that are occurring currently. Yeah. Absolutely. I think informed partnerships are key. Uh, I think that when we think about a skills gap, often it's outside of uh, policy, but even let's look about the skills gap in terms of congressional employees and staffers um, that may be new to this technology that need to learn the vocabulary, learn how it operates. Georgetown Law's Tech Institute has a congressional tech uh, assembly where we bring in staffers from the Hill and teach them about emerging technologies so that they, they can become more comfortable in that language and advising uh, congressmen and women on certain policies. So I would love to see you know more partnerships in this space um, because there is a skills gap across the board. We're moving so quickly in this space. We don't have an educational system that is informing us. Uh, academically, so it's really our, on our own to and our own responsibility to gain this knowledge at rapid speed so that we can employ it within our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, sure. yeah, look, I think regulation has to be imagined differently for, for AI. It's not necessarily going to be the same um, way as that we'd sort of encode regulation for humans, right? We're, we're not the same as these machines that we're building. So like one of the things on that, you know, if you build data sets to train models, so like ImageNet is a classic example. Um, ImageNet has all sorts of images, but it's particularly good at dogs. So the, the image classification algorithms will be able to tell you any kind of dog species like awesomely, but like it's really bad at some other things, right? So if you think about like, you know, building these kinds of data sets to train on, maybe the government has a role to kind of start assembling these things that are more kind of representative for the world that we're in, but then also perhaps mandating certain levels of performance across that. So one thing on that, you could have, you know, self-driving cars with image recognition. Well, how good are they at picking up wheelchairs crossing the road? Right? Like, is that a group of people that you don't tend to often see in San Francisco so it doesn't train very well on top of that? But then do you build a data set where that's there so the models can train on it, but also can measure it against performance on it? So I think when you think of regulation, it's probably more like kind of performance levels and exposure to data sets that are more representative of how we want our algorithms to perform rather than sort of encoding a human readable, you know, legal document. Do you mind if I interject real yeah, quick? Yeah, absolutely. I, I like that response. It just made me think of something different, which is one thing that I've seen when sort of like data scientists and computer scientists kind of, I don't want to say run amok, but I think you know what I mean when I say run amok <laughs> and say, look, we can figure it out. Um, one thing that I've seen just in the employment selection place is like, okay, well, if I just know everybody's race and gender that I'm feeding into my algorithm, I can fix it. There's a data solution for this. And I appreciate that idea, although there are some things that you can do not knowing the regulations and not knowing the space and just run into a lot of trouble. For example, it's illegal to take into account someone's race and gender when you're doing employment selection. And so that solution, while it makes sense from a mathematical perspective, 
is bad, bad, bad advice. And I think that there's some <laughs> buyers out there, like some maybe employers who might adopt those types of selection procedures, who might think, OK, great, check. The math nerds are on it, and I'll be fine. Um, and so there is a place to just make sure you're familiar with the previous regulations, the, the legal landscape, and then sort of you have to be critical as you uh, adopt these procedures. And it just depends on the space that you're working in. I want to let the audience know that after my next question, we'll be coming to you guys for questions. So start thinking about them now, condensing them all the way down, making sure that they are questions and not comments, um, and we will have somebody come around. <laughs> So we've talked a lot about this kind of from the side of employers, from the side of coders. Dolores, you touched on this a little bit. How can we think about the other side of this, the communities, and especially communities that tend to be left out the most when it comes to AI, when it comes to technological development, and empower them so that they can also meet the needs of the workforce where they are? Absolutely. And so first, I'd like to share just a few statistics to kind of put this within context. Uh, the Brookings Institute recently released a report that stated that women uh, disproportionately will be impacted by the automation of our job industry. Uh, Latinos, for example, some 60% of jobs held by Latinos will be automated, some 50% held currently held by African Americans. And so when we think about this holistically from a societal point of view, we know that our jobs are changing. It will affect us all, but it will also affect certain populations disproportionately. And so we think about, you know, where are we putting those investments that time? How are we training up? populations that have been historically underserved, it does, you know, lend its ear and lend its weight to uh, very serious and intentional uh, investments within these communities because they have already, they need to kind of exponentially increase that, that uh, their capabilities in order to catch up to where we are. And we're moving so quickly that I, I fear that this focus, though valid on K through 12 education, which is so necessary, we also need to focus right now on skills development with the current workforce. And I feel that those workforce training programs are not moving as quickly as they should. Yeah, Sean Kelly, how are you guys thinking about that from the other side? Look, I, I, I think it's, we sit here, right, and, and every, like, it seems like every other month a paper comes out. And as, as, as sort of practitioners in this, we sort of shake our heads and go, my God, it can do that now, right? And, you know, the latest paper that just came out was, was you know, around um, generative models, um, adversarial networks for, for generating images. And we just we sort of looked at it, you know, on Twitter, like last week, we're all going, my God, this, this did this. Uh, and it's really hard, right, when you think about the impact of this stuff coming, when the practitioners are being surprised at the capabilities of the technology every, you know, month. And so we're, we're sort of, I, I would say, like struggling to kind of keep up with these new things that are emerging. Um, and you know they're going to be disruptive, but we can't tell you what's going to come next month, next quarter. So to kind of come back and say, how is this technology that you don't know um, going to impact a society? I mean, that's, you know, that, that's, that's a really difficult question. So it is an important one to get right, but I would, I would sort of balance this against, it's like we don't know what we're going to end up with. Right? And so that, that's the tricky balance when you think of regulation and planning and structure. Like this, we're just at the start of this little you know, exponential curve, um, and there's a lot more to come. And I would, I would also add that I think there's opportunities for us to use AI for good in the meantime. For instance, Alice, which is a platform or website that connects small business entrepreneurs to the resources and networks that they need, they're using machine learning to better understand and diagnose the needs of entrepreneurs, then connect them to those geo-specific resources right there in their community. Um, that is kind of using this in a way to, to uh, represent or to collect historically underrepresented communities and add them to the table. And so I think, you know, how can we to your point, kind of balance this need to, to move exponentially. Things are changing so quickly, we need to inform, but also use the same technology to connect in the meantime so we're not leaving other communities behind. Right. I know we're running short two seconds on that yeah. because I love the question. Um, so I grew up in the, the Rust Belt, Buffalo, New York, right? So like lots of people that I went to school with, their parents used to have like good union jobs working for manufacturing. It's, it's gone. <laughs> and so I think of like what you were saying, I just think of like the low wage, you know, manufacturing jobs that are gonna be automated, that are being automated, the people who are affected. And again, I, I turn to AI as a, as a solution um, in terms of if we can look at those folks that are being displaced um, and look at what types of jobs in the new economy that they would be suited for and need to be retrained to do, we can use AI in that way. I could go on and on about it, but I just want to plant that seed of thought. Yeah. If we have a question or two, we can take them quickly. I think I see one over there and one right back there. Hi, this has been really interesting. Um, I'm also a data scientist. I've done a little AI work. And I was wondering, what are your thoughts around um, at 
what do you feel as though is the stopping point for AI development? What do you feel as though is the point where it can do too much? Anyone want to take that, Sean? You seem like you have thought. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it, it, so, so a concrete sort of place in that is, is coming through and saying, um, you know, look, look at war, for example. Right, and you know, there's there's been a lot of debate around you know whether you should have autonomous uh, weapons that emerge, and so the U.S. under the last Secretary of Defense came and said, well, no, no autonomous weapons. We'll have autonomous defense, but not autonomous weapons, right? And so maybe that's you know when you think about where the line is, but then you put that back and say you you know the the people that you're fighting decide to have autonomous weapons. Do you still want autonomous weapons, or are you still happy to put that line there? So I think we're going to see an arms race in an AI as it moves. And, you know, I would just kind of like put down the, the, the point here is we're at the start of this, right? Like the things that we're doing today are going to seem very, very primitive in three years. And to kind of put a line today and say this is where the line of where AI works and where it stops, I think will look very, very um, naive in, in, in even 12 months. All right. And we can take one more very speedy question. I think there was one right over here. There's a mic right there. So sorry. Hey, I had a question in regards to uh, how AI can affect soft skills. Um, during the IBM portion, they specifically said that a majority of the work was b um, based on the soft skills versus the actual technical skills. So I definitely wanted to, dealing with a specific population where the soft skills are like the things that are hardest for them, uh, they're like ready to work, but they're not work ready. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd love to hear how uh, soft skills uh, can be applied through AI. And thoughts on how soft skills can be applied through AI? Kelly? I'm not sure if this exactly was your question, but um, so the, the company that I work for measures pretty much soft skills. I probably shouldn't say that, but that's pretty much what it is. It's like cognitive, social, emotional kind of style um, and how you are, like your way of being, and how that fits with particular jobs. And so um, that's kind of my thought about as the economy is changing, who would be good for what jobs, who needs to be reskilled. You wouldn't just want to pull somebody who used to have a manufacturing job and say, great, I'm going to train you to do X. Rather, um, I would like to pull that person and say, what are you suited for? What would make you happy? What, where would you feel good? And then train you for that particular thing. Not exactly sure if that was your question, but that's my response. And, and similar to that, I think you know, we're going to move from this narrow definition of a job category as and kind of looking more to at human potential to your point, you know, what are these other aspects of your cognitive abilities, your your style, your, you know, your impact, your passion, and how can that translate into a job opportunity as opposed to a nearly defined job task? And so I think, you know, this kind of arms race between robotics and humans, you know, who's going to win, I think actually is going to force us to think more human about how we approach the job market, to remove ourselves from this, you know, very narrowly focused skill to the holistic, you know, cognition of a human experience and how that can a benefit a particular corporation or job opportunity when we think a little bit bigger in terms of how a human can uh, interact with that interface. All right, we're going to end it there. Please join me in thanking my panelists. Thank you.